Um, good afternoon. I thank you for um, coming and staying. You know, this is the last, this is late into the day. Um, and I'm very excited to share this new research um, with you. So uh, I started this project actually in 2020. So um, somewhere, you know, in the year of the, uh, the COVID pandemic, I wanted to launch this project. And um, so I'm an ethnographer, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. So I wasn't able to do ethnography because I wasn't able to travel and actually um, go to Peru. I did go the year before. Um, however, you know, I was I was able to gather enough um, uh, materials, you know, from library, and I was able to conduct Zoom interviews with some people um, in Lima. So this is a relatively uh, preliminary uh, research that I'm doing. Uh, my uh, my topic of discussion is usually on. Um, Asian diasporas in Latin America and in the Americas. So just, you know, uh, it's apropos the, the conversation just um, earlier around diasporas, right? So um, diaspora and, and the focus is on food uh, for this lecture, chifas. Has anyone heard of chifas? Okay, good, some people are nodding. Okay, well, by the end of this lecture, you will know quite a bit about it. Um, so if you travel to Peru, um, you will notice that immediately how conspicuous and ubiquitous um, chifas are in um, Lima, as well as in you know, different parts throughout Peru. And um, chifa is the word that is used to describe both the food form Chinese Peruvian food, and also the restaurants, the social cultural institutions, which serve and cook, you know, Chinese Peruvian food. But this is, I just want to take note of it because this is the only site in the Chinese diaspora actually, where it has a specific name different from, let's say Chinese American food, Chinese Peruvian, Chinese Pan Panamanian food, Chinese, you know, Mexican food. But this word chifa, actually is what is what people use to refer to the food and the restaurants. Um, they don't usually say, you know, we're at a Chinese Peruvian restaurant, but we're going to Chifa, for instance, and, and eat Chifa food. So, um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. And it's very typical, you know, um, uh, Chifa food, and um, in a sense that it's served with their popular Inca cola. And this is a relatively new, um, uh, formation in a sense that before it was most commonly served with tea, but as it becomes integrated into Peruvian culture, it kind of pulls in, you know, into orbit, um, all kinds of cultural sources, including, you know, the Inca cola drink. Um, I also want to show you this particular set of stamps. There are four stamps, national Peruvian stamps. And here you have, this just illustrates the kind of status and role of chifa in Panamanian, excuse me, Peruvian um, national um, culture and um, identity. I'm sorry, I sometimes slip into Panama because I, um, I did my research. My first dissertation research was on um, Panama. So excuse me, you know, I do mean Peru. Um, so these are the four um, types of stamps they were created in um, 20, 2017, um, celebrating the 45 years of, of Peru-China diplomatic relations. And again, this kind of reiterates and reaffirms the, the, the integration and the elevation of Chinese food, excuse me, Chifa food in Peru and Peruvian culture um, and politics. And of course, here is, if you have been to Lima um, and many of the Latin American countries, you will see these gates and it's you know it's here in san francisco of course in different parts in different cities in the u.s um but you know here's calle capon which is um capon street you know um and it's known this is chinatown barrio chino you know is, is also known as calle capon or just capon um so just to give you a framing you know of uh the chinese in um in peru so uh, I want to start by saying that this project around food, around chifa, is also, you know, a, I, I like to think of it, you know, think of the question of how does food convey cultural change and meaning in migration 
how is it, how does it get translated? How does it carried? How does it get adapted, integrated into places as, the, as people migrate and the food and culture itself migrates? What does the particular story of Chifa then tell us about the social world in which you know, the Chinese Peruvians have created, um, inhabited, and, um, and, uh, and are in fact you know, continuing to create? To understand this food um, uh, in many ways is to uh, think about um, food as a site of study as the afterlife of transoceanic, transpacific migrations, right? How does food get translated? How is food itself a site of transnational and transcultural practices? In other words, how does it generate meaning? How does it change or evolve um, with interaction through diffusion, adaptation, substitution, incorporation, and I would like to use the term trans culinarization, right? How does food convey this cultural change in meaning? So the, the conceptual framework that I like, I like for us to take on as we think through Chifa, you know, and the formation is Chifa, is to, um, you know, also think with the concept of worlding, the process of objects becoming a thing itself. You know, this goes back to Heidegger's notion of object making, right? How are objects made into and understood as an object, you know, itself? So a worlding um, process. But how do we look at worlding? How does Chifa become world into an object? Here, I like to use um, Deleuze's metaphor of the theory of, of assemblage to think about um, social the social world, right? Fundamentally, assemblage asserts that there is no um, stable, static, or fixed ontology. And the social world is continually changing and shifting and in transformation, right? So social formations then are not discrete objects. They are temporary assemblages of complex configurations that come into relations with one another and that continue to transform as they interact with other more extended sets of configurations. And these configurations are composed of heterogeneous elements of objects, signs, bodies, forces, sets of conditions, and affects, right? But it is about how things come together and, and disperse, how they form and rearrange themselves and transform over time and across space in this sense. So Chifa food, um, what is it? You know, Chifa, what is it? And how, do we, how, did, how did it come to be? You know, how, how did it come to be known as Chifa? And what is the object of Chifa that we're talking about anyways? So to give a bit of um, history um, context, you know, is that the Chinese um, uh, uh, had, have been uh, to Peru, arrived in Peru at the earliest migrations, um, uh, happened actually in the, in the 1500s, 1600s with the Manila galleon trade between the Philippines and the Americas, right? But the largest wave, one of the most significant waves, the first significant wave of migration of Chinese to Peru is the um, indentured Chinese coolie trade um, in the uh, mid 19th century here. And so you have 120,000 Chinese um, who were contracted um, into indentured labor um, in Peru. And they were there, they were brought there um, shortly around the time of the abolition of slave trade um, um, and, this, and abolition of slave slavery in Peru. And this is, and because of that, it created a, a need, an intense need for, um, for labor. And this is where the Chinese came in um, to fill that role. So between 1847 and 1874, you had 120,000 Chinese laborers, mostly men, about 10% of that, actually no, 1% of it, um, 120 women uh, were women that arrived to Peru. So you can see this large sort of gender, um, in, uh, you know, uh, an unequal gender ratio there. Um, by 1874, um, that was when it was the, the coolie trade was officially ended and it was, um, a number of, fa of factors came into play, you know, um, there were so many um, inhumane, unjust conditions um, that 
you know, that actually cause a large proportion, over 50% of these laborers um, uh, were basically um, disappeared, um, you know, by, by the end of their contract term, which is eight years. Um, it, it was, there's so many outrage, global outrage about this, that the Chinese government sent a commission um, and to study the conditions um, that in which these laborers um, were subjected. And um, at the end of the study, um, they decided that this, they're, they're, they're gonna end this, the, the coolie trade altogether. And so right after that, you have an ushering of a, a new set of migrants coming in, primarily um, merchants, um, small merchants, entrepreneurs, and, um, and free, what you consider free laborers, right? Wage laborers, let's say. So um, it's what's important to note here. I mean, like you can see the, the kind of shackling, you know, that, um, that the, the Chinese coolies, and it's, it's really a continuation um, of kind of a um, forced labor, you know? And so they, you know, these were really harsh conditions that they lived in. One of the things that were um, particularly interesting about the Chinese coolie indentured laborers was that um, food and cooks, were of paramount importance. You know, you can see in the historical records the way in which they talked about the kinds of foods that needed to be transported um, and brought, and the fact that they actually required, as part of their contract, a number of cooks who would be responsible for cooking, you know, food for these laborers. And so, you know, you see very early on this, this um, differentiation of labor of cooks kind of having getting this elevated status as opposed to field workers in this sense. And this you'll see, you know, how it evolves um, as time goes, goes on. But um, one, of, one of the reasons too of why this high status of um, Chinese cooks is the infungibility of the Chinese cook. You know, you can have many Chinese laborers exchanging jobs, you know, moving from place to place, but Chinese cooks were a, um, a premium you know, and, and they were not exchangeable. They were not fungible in that sense, right? So they accrue a certain kind of, of capital value, you know, in, in their status, in their, employ, in, in their employment as cooks. Um, so here's just a quick review of um, the waves of migrations from, um, from China to Peru. Uh, the first wave as indentured Chinese labor, the second wave, um, 1874 to early 1920s, you have um, merchants again. You also had a group of um, Chinese that were migrating from North America to, um, uh, to South America. And many of them, you can find them, you can trace um, their transit to Cuba, to Mexico, and also in Peru. And in fact, in, in Cuba, they uh, were the ones who built the infrastructure, you know, of the Chinese infrastructure, Chinatown, let's say Barrio Chino um, in Cuba, which, is, which was in fact, one of the most vibrant Chinatowns in all of the Americas until, until the, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, 1959, right? With the, um, with the revolution. So um, here, uh, you, know, you also have a similar um, migration going into uh, Latin America from North America and also from Asia. Um, and then you have another two sets of waves, um, larger waves, you know, post-1949, which is um, after the Chinese Communist Revolution that brought in a whole wave of Chinese there, and also post-1990s, which is a whole new era of Chinese investments in Latin America that brought a whole other set of um, migrants there. Um, you know, they're different, they're northerners, they're diplomats, they are managers of transnational companies, whereas before they were primarily coming from the southern part. They were Cantonese speakers um, and they were laborers primarily and um, merchants of the Guangdong, Hong Kong area. So now with the, with the food, um, ap right after, I would say right after the, um, uh, the coolie labor ended, you know, around the time of the 1874, and of course it goes in a little bit longer until the uh, end of um, their contracts, you had already a urbanization, a movement, you know, from the plantations into the urban areas of Lima. So as soon as they finished their contracts, they were going to Lima to look for new work, to um, 
to look for community members there. And this is where you begin to see a, a growth of um, the Chinese community, um, uh, uh, Chinatown, you know, in Lima. But all kinds of, there's, there's a lot of social intimacy, you know, that is um, occurring, you know, throughout this time. One, you have, even at the place of the plantation, you had um, indigenous, black, and Chinese laborers working side by side, you know, and moving around during the day, you know, going to the same um, sites, you know, for uh, work and for eating, um, for getting their foods, etc. So there's a lot of interactions that were happening um, on, on the plantations. And then when, um, when they actually went into the city, you also had um, Chinese cooks who entered into the domestic work. And I, have to, I, I will have to tell you that um, in 1860, um, the census showed that the Chinese represented 35.4% of the domestic labor force and 20% of which you know, are cooks. So again, you see this continuation of the status of you know, Chinese cooks and the plantation, but then also moving in the urban areas, they also become, um, uh, you know, known for their cooking talents. In fact, it was said to be um, that it became so fashionable in the 1880s that among the elite Peruvian society and households, uh, many of them were aspiring to get a Chinese cook, you know, into their kitchens. And so they would, um, you know, among the elite, they would have, uh, you know, a trio of racialized domestic workers, you know, butlers and maids were often um, of uh, black and indigenous backgrounds, but the cooks were almost always Chinese and a few were French. So, you know, you see this kind of division of labor, but nonetheless, you, you do see this, these spaces and continue kind of inter interactions. And out of those interactions in the plantation, in the urban areas, you had um, interracial um, family formation. And um, given the ratio, again, of um, the large proportion of men that were coming here um, without, you know, um, without women, um, the only, the ways in which they, uh, they created families were through these interracial kind of uh, family formations and relationships, right? So um, already by the turn of the century, you begin to see a mixed race generations, you know, of Chinese black, Chinese mestizo, Chinese indigenous kind of um, uh, community forming. Um, and they, you know, here is, uh, this is a central, the central market was the key downtown area and Calle Capone was really literally just a, a block away from the central market. And so you see that this was the part of the, the urbanization um, that was taking place. Um, aside from the more intimate spaces that I talked about, you know, in terms of family formation, domestic spaces, you also had then, um, once they moved into um, uh, Calle Capon, um, the public spaces that emerged where um, Chifa, um, or the precursor to Chifa food was being experimented. You have, um, were, and these were a, a variety of, um, of, of, of small, um, eateries and food service um, enterprises. There were fondas, there were um, mantequerias, there were cenas, and then finally, finally bodegas, right? All these are different kinds. Fondas are kind of like bars, you can, one can translate into. Mantequerias are places where they sold um, lard, you know, for cooking, um, uh, pork, um, uh, products and things like that. Senas were a later um, uh, um, form that emerged and they were primarily just serving dinners, you know, at night for people who were out, you know, um, uh, partying, you know, um, and, uh, and that's, that, that was created really the turn of the century. The bodegas um, are shops, corner shops, even to this day, people in Peru refer to the corner stores as, um, you know, Los Chinos de la Esquina, you know, or you just call the Chinos, you know, or, the, you know, they just know that all, many of the corner stores were run and owned by um, the Chinese. And so in all of these little, in all these places, they began to experiment with food, um, food primarily serving the working class. And this is, it converged at a time of urbanization where many of the workers, not only the Chinese, but many of the Peruvian workers um, were heading into the cities, et cetera. And because they became, it was, you know, really integrating into this wage work um, day, 
they needed to find food, you know, and provisioning of food, right? Um, and so their lunches and their dinners were um, were being served then by um, these um, small eateries that were popping up all over the place, um, but especially in the downtown area and um, in, in Calle Capon. So um, I, I do want to say that even though you have this movement of Chinese going, um, you know, to different parts of Peru at this time, there was significant anti-Asian sentiments, anti-Chinese in particular. Um, you know, th th there was a very strong wave of, of anti of, of Sinophobia. Uh, beginning, you, you see this, uh, you know, starting um, in 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 full force, really, in the um, 1878, 79, the Pacific Wars, and the Chinese were accused of assisting the the, the Pacific Wars being the Peru um, and Chile wars, and because the Chinese were seen as possible traitors and people who were supporting the Chilean um, army that there were um, a series of pogroms and massacres against the Chinese throughout different cities in Peru. Um, and this didn't stop until the 1910s. And here you see again the role of food, you know, as a uh, as zones, you know, as, as a contact zone, as a conflict zone. And um, the images, you know, this circulate throughout the hemisphere, actually. But you know, this, these are taken from Peru. They're particularized, you know, from the Peru context of, you know, again, um, claims and assertions of the Chinese using, you know, um, questionable meat, right? Um, and you see here, you know, all kinds of uh, animals, um, alligators, et cetera, that, were, that are being thrown into the pot. So it's, it's, it's the mystique, it's the mysteriousness of like, what is that that they make, right? Um, this kind of um, question that goes on in here, I think you have images of, the, of, of mice or rats, you know, that are being cut up. But what's, what's interesting here, they say, you know, um, uh, Go, go and be alert, you know, that the, the, the children of um, Canton, the Cantonese, um, are using the, you know, tripe, the innards, you know, of cats, dogs, rats, etc., to make sweet pastries, but also the word ming bao, which is a specific Chinese word, Cantonese word for buns, you know, like you can see the buns. So even back then, you could see the translation, the, the, the use of translation here, or lack thereof, rather that mean bao becomes the word to describe a bun because there was no word in um, that that was translatable or, or it just they didn't bother to do it right so this is interesting because these words become integrated into the um, pa uh, peruvian vernacular language syntax um, and mean bao is just one of them here's an example of a particular food um, that emerged in that context, you know, of contact zone, conflict zone, right? Uh, um, and, you know, along with the, the legacies of social intimacies that were formed, you know, through the 50 years of interaction, you know, um, by, the, by, the, by the beginning of the 20th century, um, we see this dish called taku taku emerging, you know, in these, um, in these fondas. And taku taku is a dish that was most um, popularly known to be associated with um, uh, uh, black Peruvians, actually. And so it was known that, you know, it's, it's a mix of rice and beans and it's refried. Basically, it's recooked, you know, it's leftovers that are recooked. And these be enter into the chifa um, uh, vernacular, you know, and it becomes sort of part of chifa food and also served in these restaurants to everyday workers. So you can imagine that, you know, the, the Chinese are there um, both creating dishes and taking what they know, taking what they see from others and responding, you know, to the local tastes and palates, you know, and demands, you know, in, um, in, in Lima, Peru. Now, what's interesting is that while people were calling the food and these places chifa for in a vernacular sense, we don't actually see the word chifa appear in newspapers, in written documents, until um, quite late, um, until I think the 1910s or so. 
And even, um, and you begin also to see with the new wave of migrants by the 1920s, the merchants were coming in. You have a transformation of the smaller eateries, the fondas, becoming, um, some of them transforming themselves into restaurants. And this is actually in line with, um, even in the US context, restaurants as we know it as a fine dining experience entered at the beginning of the, um, you know, at the turn of the, the, the 20th century. And so, um, you know, this is also happening in Peru in the sense that these smaller eateries were trying, the working class um, eateries were now transforming into middle class, elite class, fine dining restaurants. But if you look at the ads, however, um, with the exception of um, uh, the Grand Chiffon, they, the restaurants never call themselves or refer to their food as chifa because of its aff affiliation or association with working class food, you know, with the ones that were in, um, in, uh, in Calle Capon, you know, um, uh, that were tailored to, um, you know, everyday workers. Um, it's, it's, even with Gran Chiffon, it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to correct the transliteration <laughs> of the word chifa. And um, I, I don't know, most of you probably don't, maybe all of you do not know how to speak Cantonese here. Maybe Jessica does, I'm not sure. But um, chief, Chifa, you know, this has been a conundrum because people don't know where the word comes from, what it means. Okay, so um, many, many suspect that Chifa means to eat rice, you know, in, in Mandarin. If, if, if you transliterate it in a Mandarin sense, it means to eat rice. Um, Chifa, you know, Chifan with an N emphasis, but in Cantonese, which is where, which is really where the migrants are from, um, it's Jufan literally means to cook. So when you think about it, it is a labor, is a reference to a labor, right? To, ju, to Jufan um, is to cook, not to eat. So you could imagine the word then becomes a way to reference, you know, um, exchanges perhaps between um, the manager and the cooks in the back to say, hey, people are coming, go and cook Jufan. So that word gets picked up to, um, as a reference to the food and, and, um, and to the, the, the social institutions. Um, it wasn't until the 1930s that the restaurants, the middle-class elite Chinese restaurants adopted the term chifa, they, they advertise their food as chifa because that's what everyone, you know, all, mostly, you know, all Peruvians were referencing the food. That's how they know it. That's what they call it. So as much as they resisted it because they had its um, working class um, connections, it was unavoidable, right? And so you have the, you know, this kind of change, like, you know, um, San Hoi Lao here, was a fonda, you know, until um, until 1924 when it became a restaurant, and so you had these um, changes with new migrants, with upward mobility, you know, of the immigrant group. And here, I just want to also show you um, the different types of foods and the different types of fusion, you know, food that emerged um, as a result of those social intimacies, cultural intimacies, um, uh, and, and 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 interactions. Right, the lomo saltado is the quintessential Peruvian dish. I mean, every Peruvian that you walk into, they have lomo saltado. Everybody knows how to make a, a version of lomo saltado, you know, in, in, uh, in Peru. But if you know anything about the dish, it is a stir fry dish. The only thing that is different, it's stir fry beef, onions, um, tomatoes, and it adds in there fried potatoes. And again, here, potatoes is, um, uh, you know, native to um, Peruvian, and it's it's a it's a it's a staple, you know, in their daily diet. And here in this dish, you actually see how those ingredients are kind of you know brought together to create this national dish in some ways. Um, you also have um, chancho con um, tamarindo, and the use of tamarind is another thing. When you th when you think of sweet and sour sauce in Chi in Chinese cooking, it's usually created with vinegar you know, um, and, tomato, and tomato sauce. But given the context in Peru, there's a long story of, you know, someone told me why they, they switched over from vinegar to tamarind. And tamarind, again, it's a native 
food of, um, per, uh, of, of Peru. So it gets incorporated, you know, and, 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 and mixed into this um, sweet and sour dish using tamarind instead of vinegar. Um, another, uh, another dish that is, you know, very clearly kind of fusion is, is um, chi chow um, kui. Kui is guinea pig um, in, uh, in Peru. And um, kui is uh, basically, um, you know, it, it's a common food eaten by Peruvians, right? And it's not a Chinese, it's not a meat that's eaten by the Chinese. So here again, you see this, um, this fusion of using ingredients, you know, from Peru, cooking it with Chinese style, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, all these are kind of the various ways in which um, chifa as a form of fusion cuisine emerges in this particular context. Now, not only do you have these dishes here that I mentioned um, already, but in Peru, they do not call soy sauce, um, salsa de soya, you know, as expected as a, as a Spanish, but siao, which is a Cantonese word. It's a transliteration. They don't say jengibre, which is ginger in Spanish, but they say kern. That's how they refer to it. That's how they know it. Um, and then, you know, again, there are a number of words from Chinese food and Chinese cooking and ingredients that become, you know, completely integrated into um, a Peruvian, you know, vernacular, you know, so, um, and, and that is particular to Peru. I haven't seen this anywhere else in Latin America, I'll just say anywhere in Latin America. And I'll just end, it's, 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 I want to have time for some Q&A and I, I just want to end with this particular um, image here of, um, I don't know if you know, Gaston Acurio, who is the diplomat chef, you know, who is um, of Peru. He is internationally acclaimed chef, opens a number of restaurants with, you know, um, experimenting with lots of different foods. And um, he did in 19, uh, 1994 began his franchise of um, Madame Toussaint. Um, and basically it's his line of chi elite Chinese, uh, chifa food, I should say, <laughs> elite chifa food. Um, and it's, it's ongoing and, you know, it's, it still exists today. It is, um, you know, uh, people love his food. He's continually experimenting, you know, with it. Um, and there are now 10 branches of Madame Tucson. And um, Tucson is a, a, um, a Chinese, is a Peruvian, word, I, you know, I guess Spanish word in Peru that emerges to describe specifically Chinese Peruvian. So again, instead of calling them themselves, they don't refer to themselves as Chinese Peruvian, but they're Tucson's. So it's a very interesting phenomenon, you know, here in this, in this Peruvian, Peruvian case, I haven't seen this happen anywhere else in Latin America and certainly not in other, maybe, maybe in other parts of um, the diaspora, Chinese diaspora. But, you know, these are kind of the, the ways in which I think looking at food, you know, Chifa in particular as a concept of food, a social institution, um, and how it has transformed over time, you know, through um, really how, how, how different forces come into play to transform, you know, the actual food that is made, you know, in these restaurants and sites, right? So it, it reflects the processes of transculturation, the cultural intimacies and interactions, um, the innovations, as well as um, the uh, geopolitical circumstances. And um, going back to this moment here, in the 1990s was also the time when um, the new Chinese um, migrants were coming in, Chinese investments were coming in. And it is not surprising that, um, you know, you see um, Gaston at the head of this and not necessarily a, um, a, a Tucson, you know, kind of um, aspiring to this role. So I'm just gonna end there. Um, that is my lecture and story of the Chifa and I'd love to um, hear from you and, and and engage in a discussion with you.